Welcome to In the Know by Diane Schindler. This is Diane Schindler speaking. I'm the host of In the Know, the podcast show. I'm an author, a presenter, a solo nomad, a travel blogger, and a photographer. So this podcast show includes writing tips, travel tips, and my views of life from savvy and thoughtful to quirky and humorous. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to In the Know. Today, J.R. Menard talks about her novel, Coach in Cottage C, which was inspired by a former Florida State football player's time at one of the, lar- one of the largest boys' reform schools in the nation. The story reconstructs life at the Florida School for Boys when a first-time coach and a faculty member attempted to survive power struggles and hostile inmates. On a fateful day in February of 1961, he unlocked the door to College C, where he would live on campus. He could have never known how much could go wrong from that day forward. Now, drawing on memories, historic historic records, interviews, and visits to the school in nearby town, J.R. Menard and her co-author, Rosemary Mreggi, imagined the true story of a coach fighting for a boy and the inmates around him while trying to remain focused on the team and his moral sanity. This gripping tale is told through the eyes of a man who saw men at their worst moments, and yet, somehow, this coach experienced the most touching and emotional juncture of his life. Menard, let me tell you about her. She's an army brat, a mother, a teacher, a neurotechnologist, and an author who attended Wagner College in New York City and got a graduate degree at Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida. She taught junior high school, high school, and junior college classrooms and raised two daughters. She is well acquainted with the teen population. She became a part of the faculty at Job Corps in Charlestown, West Virginia, and today spends most of her time as a volunteer with the Patriot Service Dogs, who are trained at Lowell Correctional Institute in Ocala, Florida. Welcome, JR. Thank you, Diane. It's wonderful being here. You know, I imagine folks out there are feeling pretty trapped and frustrated with this virus. Hopefully, this podcast will give them a bit of a reprieve. I know. It's an interesting times. Everything's turned upside down. And thank goodness with technology, we can connect. So I appreciate it. Now, for those of you in the audience, you just need to know that JR and I have worked the last hour and a half (laughs) to make this podcast work because we ran into technical difficulties. She and I together said we are not going to forego this interview. So we worked seriously, well, I'd say an hour and, well, an hour and 24 minutes and here we are. Thank you, JR. I love your persistence. I'm happy you're here today, but before we listen to what your message is and what's inside this unique piece of writing, why don't we hear more about you? So tell me, how did you come to write Coach and Cottage C? Well, as you mentioned, Diane, I uh, wrote this with uh, my best friend and co-author, Rosemary Reggie, and the whole thing began in March of 1989. Rose and I were at a point in our life where we were having a midlife crisis. We hadn't seen each other in years, and we decided to have a little girls' reunion. Uh, We had talked about all kinds of things. Uh, We talked about what we had accomplished and how we felt about our lives, and we talked about what the future, now that we were halfway through, what was going to be next. I remember Rose saying to me, um, I know exactly what I want to do, and that's to write a book. And I thought that was a great idea because Rose had been writing articles and short stories and those kind of things for a long time. And I just told her, let's do it. Of course, she looked at me and kind of pushed back a piece of that dynamic red hair that she has. And she sighed and she said, you know, it's too late. I'm, I'm too tired. And I said, no, it's never too late. I could help you. I mean, I've written all kinds of pieces too. It's mostly been educational stuff and presentations and technical writing, but we could do it together. And she said, oh yeah, sure, you and me. And then we hugged and we laughed and remembered raising our children together. And 
we kind of fell into bed just as the sun was coming up the next morning. That the following night, we went out to dinner at a place called Malio's, which is a restaurant in Tampa. And the line was out the door, it was an hour long. We were debating on whether to leave that establishment and find another when two seats at the bar opened up. That changed our mind. So she ordered the white Russian and we uh, slid into two chairs. We ended up being right beside a gentleman uh, by the name of Victor Prinzi, who told us he had been a football quarterback at uh, Florida State University's back in the mid to late 50s. So he had a lot of stories to tell and we spent some time with him. And then the next thing we know, he asked if we would join him for dinner and we did. And we continued our conversation from there. So sometime during the meal, I asked him, or one of us asked him if men have midlife crises. And he <laughs> laughed and and uh, didn't really answer our answer our question directly, but said that there's one thing he did want to do before he died, and that was to tell a story, his story, about the time that he spent at the Florida School for Boys, which was the reform school in the Florida Panhandle back in 1961. Rose and I kind of looked at each other. We saw that his eyes were watered, and I don't know, we felt a connection with this guy. We felt like we had known him forever. And when he, he started telling us about it, he just didn't stop. He rambled and talked and, and it, was, it was wonderful. It was really engaging. That's amazing. That, I mean, talk about fortuitous. Yeah, it really was. And finally, when it was our turn to talk, we told him about what had happened the night before what we had said and he turned and he looked at us and said so you ladies want to write a book and i immediately said you bet we do then we looked at rose and she still hesitated a little bit and then she looked at both of us and said i do want to write a story i am going to write a story mm -hmm. then he came out with the words that kind of changed things for us which said do you want to write mine Wow. And we shook hands, and that's how he was born. I love this. I mean, talk about connection, and the stars seem to be lined up. Tell me, what made you and Rose feel like that you were the right people to write this very story? Well, besides the coincidences that night, um, yeah, the, the serendipity of what had just happened for the yeah. two days. I think when we heard parts of the story, we immediately related to it because Rose and I were teenagers in the 60s when this story happened. So we knew all about um, President Kennedy's election and, and the assassination, and we knew we both loved American Bandstand, and we had both watched Gunsmoke on TV. All of these things we were very, very familiar with, which would make us uh, be good people to write that. Uh, besides that, of course, I had been a teacher. I had not only taught in the public school system with the junior high, high school, and junior college level, but I'll tell you, and of course, Rose, she had been writing for years, so I didn't feel like there was anything, you know, her talent would definitely be the one that we would get us through for the first least part-time together. But I, um, I think the bigger thing of that was that we, we knew we could do it. We just did. We just mm. knew we could write this story. And we both wanted to write this together. And I think that was, that clinched the deal. Now, after th three years of working together, we finished a 30,000 word draft of the novel. And that was in 1992. And then what? Well, we put it down then because of medical reasons. Oh, I see. Things just kind of happened. and So when did you decide to go back to it? Well, actually, it was 20 years later. In 2012, my husband and I moved down from West Virginia, where we had had a thoroughbred horse farm. We moved back to Tallahassee. That's where I had raised my children. And um, the following year, a Tampa Times reporter called Rose, and he explained how this reform school had been in the, in the news for years, for decades, and because of accusations and abuses. And he read our draft and said, you need to finish this book. 
Uh, that took from 2013, it took six years. And in 2019, we had an 80,000 word novel manuscript that was worthy of publication. So this book had its start in 1989, its first draft completed in 1992, and it was resurrected in 2013, finished and published in 2019, is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, the old saying that slow and steady wins the race uh, definitely applied to us. We had no idea how long this was going to take but we were determined to get it done. It was a story that had to be told. All right, I want a few more details. Give us a few more details of the now 80,000 word story that took 30 years to Time write frame. Yeah, and, and publish. When, when he said for us to, uh, to complete the novel and to get it written as a book, and when we started investigating, we realized we had a lot of work yet left to do on it. So I went back to school at Florida State University. And I picked up some courses in creative writing, learned about memoirs, um, different writing styles, found out more about. Mm -hmm. And um, then I ended up with critique groups and beta groups, and that, that took a long time. And we finally revised it and got it where it is today. Well, tell us about it then. You have a fictional character named Matt Grazzi. Grazzi? Grazzi. Uh -huh. Can you tell us then a little bit more about the plot? Sure. Our main character is Matt Grazzi. And like we mentioned, he's a former Florida State University football star. And he doesn't make it in the pros. He was over his head, Diane. Hmm. As soon as he got to the campus, he had just taken a job as a first time coach and gym teacher. And the school he selected, or actually the school that selected him, uh, was a reform school in the Florida Panhandle. So this was a whole, a whole new thing for him. Um, he soon finds out that the job is much more complicated than he thought, not only because of the complications and other activities that were going on in campus, but uh, the start of the story starts, you know, right there with losing a dream. And I think that's something that everyone listening to us can associate with. Don't you think, Diane? I, I do. I do. Losing a dream. What happened next? Um, he was charged with building not only a football team, but it turns out that he was required to teach PE or gym classes, uh, five classes a day, 150 kids a day, and then he would start in the afternoon on being the football coach that was his course, his main focus. Mm -hmm. He also learned that he not only would coach football, but he would end up coaching other sports as well at the school. His main goal when he first got there was to recruit the toughest, most athletic inmate and to make him part of the team so that the other kids would follow him. He wanted a, a kid that would be an inspiration and he took on the toughest one. And so the story is about the relationship that they had from the very beginning, from the time they met um, until uh, the time his, his time at the school was over. It's a small cast of characters, also includes a friend and a cohort, and a boss that is and isn't his friend, and also a sweetheart. But it comes to a very difficult and satisfying conclusion that I think that your audience will enjoy reading. I understand from our conversation and the notes that you gave me that you also include information about reform schools in the late 1800s. You know, that was originally part of our book, but no, we don't. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about it, though. Please do, um, please do. Reform schools have a very bad connotation right now. Let me tell you a little bit more about how they were set up. Remember, back in the mid-1800s, all juveniles, when they were convicted of any kind of crime, whether it was running away from school or murdering someone, they were thrown into adult prisons. And so teens and younger children were all in the same place where... Uh, more serious offenders were housed. Communities in Florida and also the state legislature said this can't happen anymore. We've got to get these kids out of adult prisons. We've got to have a place for them to go. Let's build a school. Let's give them what they need as a school so that they could get back into society as better people. The intentions of what was going on, of what happened, were really quite noble and very massive. 
it was a big undertaking uh, because this is a 1400 acre campus and it has it is almost self-sufficient mm -hmm. it's an incredible school out there that had classrooms and and uh, so much more to it than you've probably heard about before so that's how the the dozier school was created along with other schools in other states now i will tell you that the dozier school at one time was the largest school in the nation it, it housed over 600 kids we don't get into that in the book we tell a little bit about it at the end but I just wanted to let you know, you know, a little bit more about how those yeah. Does your book compare with other books um, that listeners might be familiar with? That's an interesting question because um, people probably would think that the Nickel Boys, which was just recently published, uh, would compare with our book. It, but it doesn't, really, because that book is a fiction book. And it is based on the imagination of the author, who does a fantastic job. Um, he's, a, he's a very well-known and talented author. But ours is not like that. Ours is based on real events. And I think that's probably what makes the difference. Now, two books I would relate to is, there's one called The Heartmender by Andy Andrews, and uh, another one called The Orphan Train by Christine Baker Klein. We'd like to be compared with those authors more because for several reasons. One, we wanted our book to be as historically correct as possible. Uh, originally, this was even going to be a biography or a memoir. So it's it really detailed in keeping everything correct. We wanted to have our main character to have been there, mm -hmm. so to speak. We don't want to rely on reading about something and then uh, create, creating a scenario that might go with what we've read. Mm -hmm. We wanted to have it, it, it more true to, to fact there. This story is seen through the eyes of the common man or the common woman. Uh, it's not a story like, the, like uh, Andy Andrews' book and, and like the orphan train. It's, it's seen through the eyes of the common man. And we like that part about it too. Mm -hmm. So those are books. Now I will tell you, there's one more book I'd put, put uh, our book right beside in the library if you could have any books on both sides of you. And that would be uh, a crazy book called Who Moved My Cheese? I'm familiar with that book. I'm <laughs> familiar with that book. It just, I mean, I need to hear this because that sounds, I, I don't get that. I don't get that connection. So tell me. Well, I'll tell you. This is actually a business fable, as mm -hmm. you probably know. Yes, I but do. it it talks about change in one person's life or work, and the different reactions that you can have to that change. As we talked about in the beginning, it, book starts right off with such a major change. You know, your dream ends, and you have to regroup. This is happening all the time with athletes. There are many, many more who don't make it who put their heart and soul into a sport and they're in the limelight for a certain period of time and then it's over mm -hmm. and they have to totally regroup and and i think it's a hard thing for every one of us to do there's other examples in the book that really where you realize that he's got to make some changes in his life he's got to make some decisions can you give us an example of that unwanted change that happens well, beside the one we just talked about, that where the book starts with that, there's a point in the book where um, Matt has learned that he, he has other faculty responsibilities, and some of them are distressing. He has to be part of a team to retrieve inmates when they run away. The experience is overwhelming, and he has to decide whether he can remain at a place where he is not convinced that he agrees with the institution he works for. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard because at that point of his life, he's got to decide whether, as he said, to buy in or opt out. And that's something everybody can relate to too. I've seen some news reports about this school for boys and how it affected people's lives. I'm wondering if this book is at all considered controversial. 
Um, I don't know if controversial is really the right term, but I can tell you that it's different. And just because it's different, it tends to be controversial with some people. This is the first time a faculty member has ever come forward to tell this story. Mm -hmm. But I think more important is the motive behind our book compared to what you've heard about. Yes. Because I suspect you've read the headlines in newspapers, which have their own motive in being written um, to sensationalize. Uh, there's other articles and books that have been written fighting for reform with their purpose in mind. Our motivation for this book is totally different from that. We were anxious or we insisted on getting the whole story. Our story is the good and the bad, not just one side or the other. Mm -hmm. And I think you, most of what you've read, other than the fiction stories, which can come off either direction, this is the first time you're going to hear the good and the bad about a place that you only had limited point of view up to this point. So this is a piece of historical fiction inspired by what happened to one individual who was there. Mm -hmm. That's right. Can you tell us a little bit more about... Vic, Vic Prinzi. I sure can. We got to know him very well. We spent three years uh, with him from 1989 to 92. And I can tell you, he, he told us all about his time at Florida State. He had his uh, school in his high school in New York, his time at Florida State. He was a very successful football player in a school that had recently become a women's school. I, most people don't even know that Florida State University at one time was a women's college. <laughs> I didn't know that. But in 1947, it changed from that. It's got a long history of, of being different things, but it actually be, uh, stopped being a women's college in 1947. And then Vic was there in the early 50s. So he was the first part, the first team to really show their FSU talent. Mm -hmm. His roommate was uh, Burt Reynolds. Uh, Burt Reynolds was his, not only his roommate, but they played together on the field. And um, he ended up being the best man at, at uh, Burt's wedding to Lonnie Anderson. Oh, wow. Burt. We've, and we recently lost Burt. That's sad. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And we lost Vic. Uh, Vic passed away in 1998. He had a family who loved him and certainly that he loved more than anything. He was a successful businessman. You know, there was a time when uh, it, it, after the Dozier School for Boys, in fact, in 1989, when I interviewed him, he at that time was the radio host with Gene Deckerhoff. Do you follow college football at all, Diane? No, I, no I'm sorry. Tennis, <laughs> tennis, tennis and ice hockey, but not college football. Well, Vic and uh, Gene Deckerhoff were really the voices of Florida State football. They, they announced the radio show, um, and he did that for years. He was maybe 15, 18 years with Gene after that time. So he was working with Gene when I met him. He was not the main announcer. He was what they call a color analyst. And for those people who don't watch sports shows, this is really the guy that explains how a play works, or uh, throws in personal tidbits mm -hmm. about the coaches or the player when the game really isn't in motion. Uh, he talks about injuries and past plays and things. He gives the game more color. So uh, Gene talked about the game as it was happening. Vic, uh, he filled in the gaps. And I'm telling you, he, he was our partner. He was definitely a, a friend. Mm -hmm. And um, he'll be remembered and missed. Sad, but beautiful, bittersweet story, isn't it? Yes. Bitter Tell us what you would like the listeners to take away from this podcast today. First of all, I want them to take away from this podcast enough interest to go out and read a book. I certainly would hope it would be mine to realize that books are, are such a wonderful reprieve from everyday life. Um, I think from the story itself, we want people to take away, they, we want them to learn about a place that they probably know very little about. We want them to feel what it was like to be a particular person, uh, to have a particular point of view. When they close that last page of the book, 
to feel like they were really glad they read it. Yeah, me too. I, I'm eager to read it. I'm really happy that you did it. I haven't even read it. And I'm happy that you two took the time over a 30 year period to commit to writing this. And it's such a serendipitous happening, I guess, in the, in the beginning when you two met Vic one evening. But tell me what you're working on now. Are you working on another novel or a historical fiction piece? Um, I have decided to kind of um, stick with the, uh, go from the end of that story right up to today. I'm interested in learning about today's juvenile justice system and maybe make it into a novel like this one. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking probably to have one point of view like we did with this book but I'm in the process of exploring the teen court and getting the statistics of, of how many of the kids who are incarcerated today actually come back into the prison systems and what their options are. But there's so much to learn. So I'm just starting to explore that now to meet some of the people who are in that, uh, have that professions. Mm -hmm. That's a really a, a wonderful idea. How can listeners order your book, Coach in Cottage C? The first thing would be to tell you to just go to our website, which is coachincottagec.com. Because if you go in there, all you have to do is hit the buy now, buy now button, and it'll take you directly to Amazon. We're there in paperback and in Kindle. Um, we're also at two local bookstores in Tallahassee, my favorite bookstore and the Midtown Reader. It's all inf information to all of that in the show notes so people can just look at the details of this podcast and get the specific information and click on the links. Oh, that's great. Um, do you have a spot where our most recent review is? I can put that most recent review in there for sure. That would be wonderful. Because Tell I me about that most recent <laughs> review. That I just learned about it, what, yesterday. Tell yeah. me. Tell me. I'm excited for you. Uh, we're excited too. We were so pleased when we read it. It was, it was, uh, it was just really nice. It kind of validated what we have tried to accomplish here. And who wrote the review and where is it published? Liz Jamison wrote the review and she is editor, very much involved in the literary world. And she is in Tallahassee and the review was up on the Tallahassee Democrat newspapers community blog. I'll be sure to put that link in the program notes too. Here and then, Jr. I understand listeners may also win a free copy of your book. Is that still accurate? Yes, that's um, very much in tandem with what we've just talked about. You know, the Dozier School shut down in 2011. Mm -hmm. So the question is: Are delinquent boys and girls ages 10 to 17 better off in our juvenile system today? than they were in the juvenile system in 1961. Now, wow. the answer to that seems to be yes and no. Anyone who sends in stories or tidbits or experiences with the court or the penal system today for teens, we'd like to hear from you. Because I think our listeners are, there's going to be a group of people who have had experience with the juvenile system today. Mm -hmm. So I'm certainly able to make appointments with the administrators and things of that sort, but it's the personal kind of tidbits that we're, we're interested. All you have to do is go to our website if you've heard of something and any of these uh, emails that come in where we learn something, something that we can take away from it, we will send that person a free book. That's wonderful. So all they have to do is go to your website and click on contact us and write to you and you will send them then a right. free book. We're going to send probably at least five copies, mm -hmm. maybe up to 10, depending mm -hmm. on, um, on what kind of a response we get. And we'll be emailing these people back and asking them for their email address or how to get, you know, their regular address to get these things mailed off to them. Um, we're going to do that up until May 1st. If they want to spend a little bit more time on something, all they had, need to do is email us and we'll extend the time for them. Great idea. And then the opportunity for people to read your book for free is really perfect. So thanks, JR. Oh my gosh. 
we did it today. You know, as I mentioned in the beginning of this interview, it took us an hour and a half to get the technology straightened out. And you and I are both very persistent. So I appreciate your taking all the time today. I hope I can follow your progress. Well, thank you so much. I was going to add, that was my first question, is if we proceed with this with this new project that maybe we could get back with you and, and take it again from there. So that would be great. You could give me a progress report every once in a while. I think that, that would be would wonderful. Be and I also want to leave your listeners uh, with one other message, Diane. Uh, I want to leave them with a quote from Mason Cooley. It was shared to me by a friend and I think it's very appropriate. It goes like this. Reading gives us a place to go when we have to stay where we are. And I'd be honored if your listeners made Coach and Cottage C their place to go. So pertinent as we are hunkered down here today and for who knows how long in this world upside down right now. So thank you again, JR. I appreciate it so much. My pleasure. Thanks so much for listening. If you would like to support In The Know, you can do so by subscribing and sharing In The Know with your family and friends. You can like this episode, you can leave a comment, and even add a rating. Your support is very important to our success. And thank you so much for listening. See you next time on In The Know.